please, Potter. Um, we have now the last uh, panel, the last conversation about um, the, the issue of the uh, talent attraction to the, to the industry. We need a, a, a f yeah, the fourth chair because Maria Jose Galvez is coming right now from the ministry. She had a non scheduled meeting, but a very important one. And, uh, but she's right now coming, so uh, we Good. wait for her to join in a while. Um, I propose Porter, Maria Jose, and, and Christophe uh, two main issues about the, these um, talent attraction for the book industry. Uh, the first of all, we should uh, talk about skills. You already did. Yeah. We, as a foundation, have been working in, in this issue since 1981, when we were created. We just, from scratch, from the beginning, we started doing training for different people of the, uh, within the value chain. Uh, and now, thanks to the Ministry of Culture and the European Union, you have this thingy over there, it's called Parix. Parix is a new school for the, for the, publishing, for the, for the publishing industry, from authors uh, to booksellers. And we have um, uh, a set of different courses um, with a duration of almost 400 hours, each of them, uh, 20 courses, I think, or 18, 20 courses already. Uh, and we desperately need to understand what the people need. Yeah. Mm? So that is part of the reason why we try to talk about that. And um, in terms of skills, I propose to my colleagues to talk about audiences, as we did this morning. Um, new technologies, and you mentioned that issue uh, just a while ago, the uh, com um, uh, competition with the big platforms, the big American right. platforms. So, your first take, uh, Porter, on the second issue, which is new technologies, AI. What do you think that we should be doing now in terms of design uh, curriculum or certain kind of uh, training courses in order to provide the professionals of the book industry with good tools? Uh, if I understand your question correctly, Luis, you mean what should we do in order to plan to communicate to them how AI will impact uh, the industry if they come in as, as new talent? Uh, yeah, and what the kind of skills that we need mm. for the publishing industry mm. uh, linked to that uh, challenge. Well, I think it, it, what yeah. Christoph was saying was so good is because we need to get people who can actually discern what it is that publishing can use and what it is that publishing cannot, right? We need people who can more quickly than the rest of us get an understanding of, as I, I liked what you were saying, Christoph, people who are at a publishing house and they are trying chat GPT on something they do every day, right? I want to know those people because I think the skill sets they're developing in terms of trial and error can be one of the most important things a publisher needs. You need your staffers who are advanced a little bit and who have tested things out and who have said, oh God, we couldn't use that. This thing came in from a ridiculous source but found something else and went, oh, this is useful. I could actually trust this. I can tell where it came from. I can produce perhaps a marketing piece. I can produce something that might go to, go to me, the press, go to the journalist, that this can really help me speed up and do and even be deeper because it's done more research than I could. That person, I think, on the staff becomes good. So the skill set there is to be able to understand the technology coming in and to parse out, will it work for us at all? If it does, where will it work for us at all? When will it not work for us? That may be the more important question. Mm -hmm. When do we get into terrible trouble if we let it work for us, right? That's the kind of person I'm looking for if I'm looking for a skill set. I want somebody who's got the testability uh, for a new technology. Okay. Christoph, what do you think? Um, I, I would like to say something uh, with respect to audiences. Is that okay? 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, um, it's probably a good thing, and I see that with our students, uh, if they are engaged uh, uh, semi-professionally in the same kind of literacy they're reading. I mean, here, TikTok literature, uh, enemies to lovers, and all that. And I think a part of the, of the profile we need is some kind of professionalism, meaning in 10 years' time, they are asked to produce, market, whatever, literature they probably themselves don't find interesting at all. So they, they, they shouldn't bring their own interests and what they do professionally too closely. We need that now because we don't know uh, anything, well, not much at least, about TikTok, so that's necessary. But um, they, they have to be ready to be, uh, to, to, profession, to be professional, and to be professional also means to do the right thing with content you, you don't really like, but uh, people demand and, and, and all that. We're not talking about Gallimard and Surkamp editors, but we're talking about middle-of-the-road editors here. And, and another thing, uh, I think, is some kind of, uh, not just um, say, I'm now very well trained and I go to the industry and I wait what they, ex what they expect of me. But rather to say there's something I know more about than anyone else and I'm really interested in and I want to, to bring that to the market and see what they ca can do with it. I think th th those two, um, and I have to say, um, not many students uh, have those parts of profiles. Of, of our students, I, I have to admit. And I, I don't exactly know how much of that you can teach or how much of that is just in the people and you, 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 you should be lucky to get the, the, the right people in your course. And if not, bad luck. Yeah. The issue is, is really relevant. Um, during this morning, we listened at uh, Matt and Shona. I think that I learned a, a lot of things about young audiences. Uh, from this point of view that uh, Professor Blessy was uh, mentioning, what do you think um, about the degree of adaptation of our publishing industry and booksellers also, if I may, ah. um, to these new kind of trends in behavior, uh, heavy readers, mainly, again, female, eh? yeah. Uh, yeah. teenagers. What is this meaning for, for us? I, well, you know, it's funny, I, I was taken aback when I, I talked to James Daunt, who of course is the head of Waterstones and the head of Bar Barnes & Noble, and amazingly. <laughs> and I was, I was talking with him about this earlier this year, and he said that he had been just as shocked to find that when he gave the green light to his staff, this is particularly in England he was talking, gave the green light to his staff to start using TikTok to get out there talk about what they like to read, also to communicate, and we're having an event about this at the Piccadilly store tonight, right, 7.30, that it was an amazing response to begin with, but also that his staff suddenly lit right up. The more they got into it, the more excited they were about it, the more thrilled they were that I, they could actually drive traffic into the store, the more proud they were, because who doesn't want to get to say to James Daunt, I brought 15 people in tonight, that's pretty good, <laughs> right? They, they, for the first time, he said, it was as if they had put some levers and gears into the staff's hands, because they could get onto their own phones and start doing it. Now, this, this is a bit risky, as any company will tell you, because the wrong employee may send the wrong message. So far, though, he's been very forthright with them and explained how it needs to be done and where the parameters are, and they're, they're following this, and they're using it very well. So the surprise there was that in terms of social, a staff turned onto it was able to respond very quickly and to start raising things. This then becomes a part of the skill set that he's looking for when he's going now to new staffers, and that he's looking for the existing staffers to transmit to each other. They're all teaching each other, how did you do that last night with that book by so-and-so, right? It's, it's very interesting to see a certain autonomy starting to develop in terms of communicational reach. And he, he said, you know, it was the biggest surprise of his career because he had been a bit fearful of what might happen if everybody just started tweeting and, and take the book talking um, and going out onto Instagram with things. Instead, it's been a huge, wonderful boost to what they're doing. So this is just one example, but it's a big example. And it shows that I think properly handled and trusted staffers can start to find their ways through this and navigate it to the benefit of booksellers. 
And if we talk about audiences, uh, okay, we just focused now on this segment, uh, age mm. segment. Mm. But do you do you think that is there any other segment of population that should be take especially care of? Uh, I don't know uh, veterans as we are, for instance, um, uh, in order to to keep uh, to keep the people. Uh, reading and uh, to keep the engagement of the readers with the market, uh, all that kind, because TikTok is, is great for, for this age group, but I suppose that you may imagine all the kind of segments that should be considered. Mm. Uh, this is really interesting. I, ha I have developed a, a, a master thesis concept last week with a student. She's working for a publishing house that does literary fiction and mid-list fiction. And uh, the, the analysis was, uh, you can reach with TikTok, uh, that's so much for professionalism, um, these uh, uh, um, enemies to lovers kind of uh, uh, young adults. And um, for literary fiction, the art sections and some book blogs are still very important, Frankfurt Allgemeine and La Repubblica and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But what about uh, mid-brow literature for people between 30 and 50? And then she said, well, we don't really have an idea on that. Probably most of them are on Facebook, but that's about yeah. all we know. So what she's now talking about, uh, in spite of generationally rather closer to the TikTok generation, thinks about how people be, uh, um, at least a bit digitally uh, minded people between 30 and 50, which are not uh, uh, connected to the literary uh, discourse can be approached uh, with which platforms, with which message, and so I think that's that's very interesting and and tells us a bit about what we had dis dis discussed so far. Yeah. yeah, I could make one more point too. I think you, I think we hear from the Tandem Collective later in the week, right? Yes, the three of them yeah. are oh, hey, here hey, with us. There they are. Hi, welcome. Good. <laughs> yeah, indeed, welcome. Um, I, I had Naomi Bacon with me in Taipei um, earlier this year. I think it was this year. And <laughs> she, well, she was extraordinary. It was, it, was, uh, it was a whole room of Korean, of, of um, Taiwanese uh, publishers just turned right on. They were so excited by it because what you will understand when our, when our friends here talk to you is that they have developed a system. Back in the 18th century, I was an actor, right? And we were, we were taught to a way to act, a way to work, a way to approach a character rather than just saying, oh, tomorrow I have to act like I'm so-and-so. And by getting a way to approach something like that, you have a very clear pathway into what you want to achieve and what's going to return. This is what Tandem Collective has created, and they do it for publishers. A client will come in, and it might be Penguin Random House, and they will say, here comes this book in six months. Is that enough time for you guys to get ready? And they will plan out a remarkable program in which the reader, the potential readers are becoming their own ambassadors of this material and producing their own material they want to offer to each other about what they're reading. They're reading it together. It becomes an enormous reading session. And they're working through social media, in, in many cases through uh, book talk. Um, but other social media is perfectly acceptable too, and uh, Tandem is able to do most of them. So I found this a remarkable approach because for the first time I saw it thought out, and I saw the timing set there, I saw every step of the way going through chapter by chapter, section by section, response by response. This empowers the potential reader and hopefully the buyer to then become a missionary, an emissary for the book, and they, they make it their own. And this is the extraordinary capacity, I think, of so much of social ma media, is that the person who is excited about it becomes the advocate for it. So I, I certainly urge you to make sure you see the session when our friends from Tandem Collective are able to talk about it. It's an extraordinary approach. Some of my friends know that I have a huge fan uh, of uh, Asimov literature. Ah, yeah. um, his idea of 4C, the, the future and try to adapt our behavior to the to the future. One of the <laughs> Enrico is laughing. Uh, one of the <laughs> one of the ideas uh, that uh, came to my mind when you, uh, I was listening to you was, what if we do an effort to link uh, reading surveys? Here comes the Eric Swan. Uh, reading services, uh, reading sur uh, surveys with 
the design of the, uh, let's say, the toolkit for the, for the professionals of the book. Trying to understand what is going to happen in five years' time, ten years' time. Do you think this could be possible? I think so, and probably um, uh, people doing a management course in other uh, industries, they probably would be confronted with something mm -hmm. like that from the beginning, mm -hmm. because the, everyone would say we only can produce sensibly things that people uh, desire. Um, in the book business, this is some, some is also true, but part, but particularly f uh, following the Romantic period in in Germany, there's also this mindset which go, uh, which starts with. Uh, something like good literature and we have to persuade people and there might be niches in the market for that but anywhere else market research looking at figures uh, doing qualitative research on, on, on your own is, is very important and I think uh, we, we have done that uh, too, 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 too little uh, definitely but this is one of the reasons we share a project called Erix which is uh, an attempt to unify the European data on reading behavior and, yes. and I am no it's no problem Join us. Maria Jose. no 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 um, so now we are all the team is now gathered we were talking about the some skills that we consider um, core business now for the for the publishing industry um, because of the new technologies or because of the uh, changes or transformations uh, within some segments of the audiences, or uh, another of our, our obsessions, because we need, uh, from Europe at least, to try to compete with the big platforms uh, from the publishing industry. So I know this is really hard for you. We are so grateful that you made it. But if you want to share any kind of thought that you were thinking uh, when when they, you were coming from the meeting. <laughs> thank, thank you. I first think that of all, we, are, we, we have a, a good relation because if not, I wouldn't dare to say that to just somebody who just arrived. First of all, uh, good morning, and I apologize for arriving late. I'm so sorry I couldn't avoid it, and I'm sorry for the audience and also for my partners here in this panel. No, no problem, I'm no so problem. so sorry. And uh, Luis, of course, we have this uh, good relationship, so you can say and ask. Mm -hmm. And this is why I said you um, yes in order to participate in this in this table. That is very difficult for for me. It's very difficult from the public uh, point of of view. But of course, I'm so happy to listen to you and to share with you my thoughts and my and my reflections and I think that at the very heart of everything and also how uh, the book sector uh, can attract the best um, workers the best jobs the best people for for um, um, is training is training is knowledge and is knowledge adapted to the changes that society has lived in the in the last years? Of course, technologies uh, and the relationship between authors and readers is so 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 important in seeing the type of uh, of jobs that the sector needs and how the industry can attract the best people for the best job. Okay, then skipping to the next point. How to attract people to this industry also means what kind of image, what kind of branding has publishing for the young people. If my daughter or your daughter uh, ask me, uh, would, sh should I uh, join, let's say, the public administration? Guess what? I would say, no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't become civil servant, no. This is a mistake I made. <laughs> Don't do that. If we have the same question about joining the publishing industry, we have to think about the kind of image we are showing to the new generations. Mm -hmm. In your job, precisely, you are dealing with this challenge, Christophe. Um, I have to say that, uh, I mean, one particular point for the German situation, uh, it's certainly easier to build uh, a positive image um, if, if the pay is okay. And from all I know, uh, I, I don't know anything, uh, uh, everything that people don't like 
to talk about it too much. But then, especially in the first 10 or 15 years, if you don't do a career, the pay is really bad compared to, uh, comparatively bad compared to, to other industries. And I have the feeling, and someone would have to, to uh, confirm, that this is, for example, part of the difference in the UK. Um, it, the, the pressure is higher, the, the professionalism is higher, but I think also the pay is higher. And apparently they even succeeded in getting in people that normally would have gone to the banking sector, for example, or the consult consultancy. Mm -hmm. No way uh, achieving something like that in Germany, no way whatsoever. Because we're talking about double, triple uh, wow. uh, wage. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. I think salary and the possibility of a career are both things that for our children to, to, to want to be in this sector. But I think, at least, I think it's the, it's the same in all Europe, that the ecosystem of book industry is so diverse. So that depends on the area you are in the book sector or in the ecosystem, that the salaries and the career opportunities are different. For example, it's not the same uh, being an author that working in the comic sector um, or being an illustrator or um, being, I don't know in English, um, Las Artes Graficas, the print industry. To, to be a technical in the print industry, or being a bookseller, or a publisher, or what type of publishing house are you working in? So this professionalization and uh, the salary and career opportunities, that depends on in which part of the ecosystem, in the book ecosystem you are. But I think these two things are uh, the, the most important in order to attract people and very professionalize people to the book industry, I think. Indeed. I, one of the, uh, relative to something I was mentioning this morning in terms of the gender balance in the workforce of publishing in various markets, uh, Sophie de Closet, who was at the time the um, uh, publisher at Fayard in Paris, was handed this marvelous job by um, Arnaud Nouri, who was still there at the time, um, and he was very excited about putting her there, and she walked in and she said, I had 36 women looking back at me. That was the entire staff. She had no men. And she found that what was important in order to integrate men into her publishing house staff was to raise those entry-level prices. <laughs> because guys, being guys, would come out and say, well, I'm not going to work for that. While, sadly, women felt like they could go in for what was not a very good salary at the beginning levels, right? So she raised all of those salaries for everybody, whatever gender you were. You got more money when you joined Fayard and started working there, and she got men. They came in because she was able to get it to a level that guys felt was acceptable for the station in life they felt they were at. Um, this says a lot about guys, obviously, but it also says a lot about publishing. And that as, you're, as we're saying, you know, if the entry level is so low, uh, we can't expect to get even a balance in, in the industry. And if I may say something, and it leads to the fact that you basically uh, only get people that are really convicted of a certain kind of, of, of literature, which might help in some cases, but some kind of professionalism uh, lacks. So they, they like some kind of literature and they want to do something about it, as opposed to, um, I am a professional, I, am, I want to, for example, in marketing, sell books, and I don't matter what kind of books I will use, marketing methods from whatever industries, totally different minds. Mindset, but a mindset you, which you probably would rather find with people that have competing offers with, with higher wages. If you, have, if you, you want to get them, you have to, to, to pay more. Okay. And Luis, if I can yes. add an, an experience. In the last few years that I have gone to a lot of book fairs, not only abroad, but also in Spain, in a small cities, I, I find an anytime more young, people, very professionalized, very well formed in universities, uh, women, yeah. and they um, enter in the sector with their own publishing, independent publishing houses. I don't know mm, the way that can be a successful um, thing, publishing house or not, but uh, I think there's an intangible in this sector that uh, other than salary and career opportunities is that there are a lot of people that want to be in the book industry, in the book sector. Yes. And I think that what we have is to provide the best 
facilities, either in the private sector or with the public uh, policies, in order to facilitate that. Mm. Okay. Louise, I, I, this is exactly right. And, and what Louise was saying earlier, I think means something too. The branding of the industry, the what is it, when we say publishing, is very amorphous right now, and this is a mistake. Because when all of the other industries are coming in to eat our lunch, if you'll pardon an American expression, <laughs> and they will, we need to be able to say, we, well, I'm the journalist talking about publishing, I need to be able to say that publishing is the foundational art, that it is the one from which the stories begin. Speaking of Asimov, we're now into foundation, right? This is the place at which it begins with a book. Now, that's not always the case, but this is a problem because we're losing very good people who might have come into publishing to film and to television. Mm -hmm. They can write and they can produce in a place there that they cannot do in books. This is not good. We need them coming to us. And so I think that if the industry as a whole could start representing itself as the foundational storytelling medium and a group of media, then it's clearer to the young person particularly, but to anyone in any stage of their career. What am I going to publishing for? Ah, because that's where the story starts. Yeah. Last year, we had the um, same kind of conversation with uh, Monica Kolb and Nana Lorengal, uh, because we have this project in partnership with the whole value chain of the book industry in Spain and the Minister of Culture, of course. I was talking about before, Arix. Here you have the list of the course that we are now uh, teaching during these uh, last months. So the point is that one of the reasons we created uh, in 2006 and recreated 10 years ago, Read Magic, was to import uh, skills from other industries, as you just exactly. mentioned, or exactly. in your uh, speech about the silo and the manifesto and all yep. that. Uh, important issue. From this point of view, we have seen the previous presentations about uh, uh, accessibility. Mm -hmm. I ask you if you think that is there any kind of a skill that we should take from other, other industries? And a second issue, sustainability. On Friday, we will have this uh, in partnership with, with Canon, and, and, and uh, there is a, a really important work doing by Elsevier and, and, and API. Uh, this is going to be huge, I think, for this industry. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I think to take to Parix people I know from the logistics, from other industries, for, from the big supermarkets, but I'm not sure if you think that this could be a good idea or what kind of um, skills or tools we should import from other fields of action. Mm. Yeah, the sustainability uh, is very important where we have to say that some basic figures we know we need for that are not available. For example, you don't exactly know what the CO2 footprint of an e-reader, for example, is. And it's even hard, to, a, a bit easier, but even still hard to find out what the EU fit, footprint of the delivery of one e-book is. Uh, you can say something about printed books, but I think the mindset um, um, is, is, is very important if, if the book industry compared, for example, to the web or the film industry can make much of a difference, I don't know. But uh, certainly, um, well, if, if digital turns out to be a problem, which could be the case, every single Google uh, query mm and uh, causes that and that and that. Then, of course, uh, printed books, um, as we have seen from the points of the readers, might gain additional attractivity. And, and this also would then, uh, would, could be then um, a, a message from, from the industry. We provide uh, non-digital uh, and uh, sustain, with respect to sustainability, well-defined uh, acceptable products. But the mindset is uh, we, we, we have to have, but not only we, but also the, the publishing industry. Okay, what do you think about this issue? 
me? Go, please, yes, thanks, Maria. I think in both aspects you mentioned, Luis, accessibility and sustainability, and I hope to to be in the in these uh, panels because I think they are very very interesting. Uh, I think in accessibility, the book sector has done a very well job in the last years, either in the digital way of access, either in the physical way of access, in a book, in a bookstore, in a library. I think uh, accessibility, we have achieved, and there are also a lot of European directives in this, in this sense. And I think we have done a very good job in the book industry and with all the point of views. And I think in sustainability, we are in the middle of that. I think there's a lot of things to do, and I was thinking that, for example, in the, in the clothing area, they have uh, um, uh, increased a lot in how they explain to, to customers um, how they have done in being more sustainable. And I think the book industry, at least in Spain, but I think it's a European thing, is in the middle of that process now. We, I think we have to be more pedagogics with the readers in this case. And also inside the ecosystem of the book, I think logistics, authors, publishers, we have to, to, to understand each other why this is the way in sustainability. And then I don't know which type of skills has to be a person in order to, to be more sustainable, but of course. Maybe also metadata, metadata um, yes. within the yes. whole value yeah. chain and uh, the kind of cooperation yes. that we sometimes lack of in, within the industry could yes. be interesting. Both, both things, pedagogy, because we all have to, to want and to know that the sustainability mm. for the book industry is the only way, the only possible way, and the skills for the people that is joining the sector. Porter. I, I, think, I think it's a time to think of uh, almost reverse engineering some of the positions in publishing. And, and by that I mean that inside publishing it's fairly clear what a standard house needs. I mean, you've mentioned metadata. There has got to be somebody who is actually, it can no longer be what we call the drunken intern, right, doing your metadata. You have got to have somebody who truly knows what a platform like Amazon is going to do with your metadata to surface that thing above so many other books. These, these tasks are known. I think what we're looking for in terms of employees, this kind of brings all of our, our questions together, I think, in terms of who the next employees are, what the next skills we need from them are, is to ask them. Now, this would scare your human resources office to death, but honestly, I think we need to be able to get to people who have a certain range of background material, a certain educational level, perhaps, a certain interest shown in one way or another. It may be in literature, maybe in, in other nearby arts, as we say, um, so that we have certain criteria that we're looking for. And then when we bring a person like this in, I, w I won't say the, the company I'm referring to here because they asked that they keep it quiet, but once I was, I was hired so that the rest of the staff wouldn't be too jealous, I was hired by a company that gave me a month just to talk to everybody else at the company and find out what was missing and what was needed. My, my basic area I was working in was media production, right? Um, we needed to be able to create media about what this organization did. But first, we had to find out what the organization did because the higher-ups were really quite out of touch with the ground staff, and it was great. I was able to find out the amazing things these employees were doing. This was a way of using me, however, that was rather risky. This company was able to bring me in and say, whatever report you give to us, we're going to listen to. We're going to get surprises. We may like some. We may not like some. I think we need to think of something like this in terms of everybody we're looking for. Perhaps the next great story is coming in, not even from an author. It might be the editor sitting on your desk three days after you hired her, and this is a great surprise, right? Other, other things that are happening, especially in Italy right now, the market I see the most of this, is this huge surge of interest in comics and other graphic narratives, right? The young people in particular are going for visualized literature in enormous numbers. The booksellers are finding that if they'll put James Joyce right next to the comic books, the kids will come out with the comic books and a copy of, of Ulysses under the other arm, right? They're able to make the jump. They can understand 
the storytelling power of both sets of media quite well. I think we want to talk to the people who are reading this way, to the young adults who are going to bookstores, looking first for a comic and coming out with James Joyce and say, what on earth made you put those two things together? That's valuable to us as a publishing house. What do you think we need to actually acquire next, right? That person knows something that's not so well known inside the publishing house at this point. So the more I think we try to invest in what the incoming employee needs, again, it's difficult because you've got to define a, a few sets of criteria of talent that you need to bring in, but then let them talk to you about why they wanted to come to you and what they're looking for, and perhaps give them a trial period, as I was given, to bring back information that the house just doesn't have yet. So this, oh yeah, please. Sorry. But Does that make sense? No, 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 I, I, yes, it has all the sense because it's the incoming people to the sector, but also the people that is already in the sector. I was looking at, at ANTA, and I was thinking in the tools, in the digital tools that we have in the Spanish book sector, uh, um, for yeah. example, um, Data Libre, Libre Rece, Galen Red, yeah. um, Dilbe, um, Todos Tus Libros, they are different technological, marketing, uh, digitalization tools uh, right. for being related and for being more, um, um, in order to be most, more efficient in the, in the book ecosystem. Precisely. And I think that it's important that the people who already is working in the sector uh, had the knowledge in order to use these tools, in order to be more efficient now. So I think this is why Parix can be so useful now and in the future. Hopefully, yes. Hope. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so it's very important to attract talent and retain talent. Yes. And uh, listening to you, Marie Jose and, and Potter also, to attract top talent, it is now really important to have a good image for about the, the industry. If the employee referrals are a powerful tool for recruiting, uh, um, it's because they come from a trusted, a trusted source. So what is your opinion about the whole image of this industry? Um, you could, you could um, make a difference between non-readers and readers. Maybe that's a, a variable to take, uh, to take in, in account. What do you think? You mean the, the, the image now? Yeah. Uh, well, old-fashioned, old 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 a little bit old-fashioned. Uh, th okay. th that's not always correct, of course, but I think uh, that the public perception is um, a little bit old-fashioned digitization only if it's unavoidable. Uh, highbrow, of course, um, turtleneck kind of red wine. Red wine is in, in five minutes later. I was going to say, what's wrong with red wine in the turtle, man? We had some yesterday. Yes, we did. Man, it okay. was wonderful. And maybe some sort of romanticization of the sector mm -hmm. that is not in the whole true. Maybe. The emotional yes. Mm -hmm. yes. phase of the yes. industry. It's not all the time uh, drinking red wine. So. Right. right. One of the most interesting things we've seen um, occurring is the, the sudden power of nonfiction books in the political realm. And now, of course, in the United States, we had a reason that everybody needed to read a book on politics. Uh, we hope that's getting a little better. But the, the, the evolving nature now is what's interesting of political books and political publications. One, one of our greatest houses, um, a little bit ironically because of the failed attempt at an acquisition by Penguin Random House, is Simon & Schuster. They're our leading political nonfiction house and they have the biggest names writing for them. And so everybody wants to read, whatever side of the political situation you may be on, everybody wants to read this material. And suddenly, that sector of publishing has gone through the roof in the United States. It has cooled a little uh, since the latest election, but it will heat up again as we approach another election. And this has taught us something about how the audience looks at books about these things. To, to publishing people, it's a little scary because a book cannot be as fast as television can, as the nightly news can, as the 24-hour cable can. But a book is seen as having the facts right, mm. which is a fascinating and very valuable point. 
If the audience, this is not always the case, we have some embarrassing moments, <laughs> but if this is the, the vision, if this is the image that people come to publishing with, I will get the accurate story behind what happened in this election or what happened in that campaign. This is very powerful. That's what people are looking for. So one of the calling cards I think that publishing can really build on is we're the guys with the facts. We're the ones you can trust. We're not working 24 hours to try to get it out as fast as we can. We're actually going to take our time, fact check it, and get it right. That can be very valuable. I, I, I agree, again. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about credibility, uh, about credibility. Uh, publishing house. Exactly. So this is why it's so, so important, quality and bibliodiversity. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. So my personal takeaways from, from this whole morning is we should, Javier, we should create a course on accessibility for Parix, another one on audio, another one on sustainability. We will try with the AI. We will try. <laughs> and uh, maybe, listening at both of you, um, when you talked about uh, this flexibility, and I would say, I would add, um, uh, how could I? autonomy when you work in, in, in a publishing house, for instance, yeah. uh, in terms of personal schedule, probably we should organize a course on post-pandemic ways of working, um, uh, hybrid systems, mm -hmm. um, even the, the challenges or the problems that we are facing when we are working in teams. No? Yeah. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah. OK. Um, I know we are hungry. We are thirsty, but if he, anybody would like to address to the three guests any sort of question, they are ready for you. Raise your hand. Who are you? <laughs> ah, Anta, <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK, so thank you very much. It was really interesting. I liked very much the idea of uh, Porter of rebranding the sector. Uh, that I think is also part of the of the idea. Of course, the education of the professionals was also sent an image to the society of what we are doing in the book sector. In order to remove this old-fashioned or romanticism idea, and and it's a question not only for Spain; it's at the international level. So, it's, it's a question for the whole uh, round table. What do you think can we do regarding this? rebranding in order to priorities and we can start how can we can start with this uh, I know Luis is every year thinking about the uh, we, we now to create an history and we now to create a, a message to the society regarding the work that is the narrative the narrative of the book industry so we how can we start with this narrative this rebranding Everyone's looking at me, yes? Okay. <laughs> Actually, I, I, this can be said very quickly. It's called setting the agenda. It used to be something that journalism was better at because there was a day when journalists walked in in the morning, decided what was going to have to be said that day to their readers. This was newspapers primarily, and arranged it, put it out. There it was. It is better now that journalism is not trying to set the agenda because we need to be vulnerable to the news of the day. But in publishing, I think that is how publishing establishes its centricity. It says, we are the people you're coming to for the agenda of the day. We're going to drive the topics that need to be talked about. We're going to give you whether we're working in fiction that's beautiful and literary, or whether we're going to give you something entertaining like romance, or whether we're going to talk about the political nonfiction. We're going to drive you and guide you to exactly what we feel is the most important thing. One of the great things that can come of this, and I think it was Michelle speaking about this a little bit earlier in her panel, is that the publishing houses themselves can gain more visibility and notoriety and recognition. There are, there are people who still don't know Penguin Random House from Hachette or from Macmillan. Or, you know, it's, it's quite astonishing, even in the very biggest houses, because the publishers have never actually worked to establish their own identities. I think that if they are asked to and are on board with driving the agenda, then they want to step out and claim, this is what we decided was important. We are so proud of this author because we knew this is what we wanted to deliver to the audience and to the population at this time in history. 
I, so to me, that is the way. Set the agenda. What do you guys think? I think there's, uh, we, we, we can change this old-fashioned perception of readers and of, uh, but I think it's already changing uh, because the book industry has incorporated um, the ways of relationship with uh, readers. We are seeing these weeks in the Madrid Book Fair. This is different. We have uh, another multi-channel relationship with readers, and I think um, above all, young readers. So I think this is changing. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to do a lot of, uh, for example, when Spain participated in the, in the Frankfurt Book Fair, I know in, in Germany, they were so surprised about uh, this combination of quality and creativity, professionalization in our publishing industry, and the way you show it. You can show how you are without being old-fashioned. You can be creative, uh, uh, vanguardistic, I don't know the word in English. Avant-garde, yeah. Avant-garde. And then uh, we have to explain that taking care of the book processes mm -hmm. is not old-fashioned. Okay, exactly. Yeah. That's very modern. Yeah. Indeed. It's very modern. Yes. yes. And keeping the wine as well. <laughs> yes. I think uh, ve very... Um, Important propagators are people that uh, are, are comparatively new to the industry, been there for three or four years. We have a series on, on, a, on our social media channel where um, students ask them about what they do. And I think the problem with respect to what we have discussed is that they are uh, not using big words and only talk about working conditions and how nice these children's books are, rather than talking about setting the agenda, diversity, sustainability, uh, prime okay. storytelling medium and all that. Right. And I think it's the task of the student journalist to ask these questions. If they don't come up with, with, with uh, the big words, it might be okay, but we should ask them so that they uh, are used as, as propagators of the fact that the publishing industry um, is, is really connected to these big concepts. I love your use of the term provocator, provocateur. We need that to happen. Yeah. We need people to ask the industry questions that it then has to answer with the agenda. The perfect cycle, you know? Jolly good. Then we are settled and uh, let's have some drinks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.